So I was asked, how is evidence translated into policy? And the first thing I thought is, well, I can tell you what would be nice and then my sort of fantasy of how evidence would be translated into policy. So I have the image of a butterfly as we think of beautiful transformations. And we start off with evidence of a problem. And you would have a policymaker, and in the US, they would request from the National Academy of Medicine a report to tell us what do we know about this problem. The experts would come together. They would make an evidence-based policy recommendation. The policy would then be written by the policymakers based exactly on those recommendations. The policy would pass. The policy would then get implemented, and you know, because we're fantasizing here, on time as written, exactly. Um, then, you know, researchers would have funding to go back and study the impact of that policy. And then, you know, if we learned something new, the policy would then be updated based on evidence. So this ideally is what um, the process should look like. Now, in practice, it's a little bit different. Now, I think the beginning part is actually pretty good, at least in, in the area that I study in terms of obesity. We've had um, policymakers request reports, and we've had actually quite a number of reports come out where experts had, have made evidence-based policy recommendations. But then this sort of sausage-making process begins. Um, and the first group that shows up is the, in our field anyway, is the food industry. They want to be part of the conversation, they want to be part of the solution, and they want to know what's going on. Um, the lobbyists then show up in Washington, D.C. And you may eventually get a policy written. It may not quite be based exactly on the recommendations. Then you have more fighting um, in Congress or whatever body is making this policy. Um, I put the soda can here just to sort of remind me to mention. So for example, in some of the cities that have passed sugary drink taxes in the United States, they, they all look different. Oftentimes, the amount getting taxed in terms of pennies per ounce will change over the course of this conversation. Sometimes diet soda will get added into the mix. So we've ended up with quite a hodgepodge of different policies um, across the country. But eventually, a policy will pass. Um, the policy will be implemented um, maybe on time, maybe as written, or maybe not. And a good example of this is menu labeling, which was originally passed as part of the Affordable Care Act back in 2010. And um, a number of things happened. The restaurants had a lot to say about how they thought this policy should get implemented. And in particular, the pizza industry um, had a lot to say. Apparently, pizza is very complicated. You don't know what you have as your topping, and so your calories could really be, you know, is it pepperoni? Is it mushroom? And the other group that had a lot to say were the movie theaters with the big popcorn. So this went on for years, literally eight years, until finally the policy was supposedly implemented last May. So then researchers may or may not have funding to study the impact, and the policy may be updated, maybe based on the evidence, maybe not based on the evidence, maybe because you've had a change in administration by this point, and you have a new political party in place which may have different feelings about the policy. So here's an example um, of where I feel like the process actually overall went pretty well. And this is the Federal Child Nutrition um, Act in the United States. Um, and the, you know, the problem of childhood obesity was very well documented. Um, policymakers requested actually quite a lot of reports from the National Academy of Medicine, and experts made a lot of recommendations, and I actually ran out of room on my slides. There were a lot of reports that came out with all kinds of great recommendations. Um, policies were written uh, based on those recommendations. In particular, I think one that really shows, uh, you know, sort of was in my mind sort of the star in terms of progress was um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, in part, I think, because it was championed by First Lady Michelle Obama. And it did pass, and so that act was in 2010. And then the implementation there got a little bit shaky. So um, I don't know how much. This, you know, was sort of heard in other places, but there was this whole potato controversy. The original recommendation was to limit potatoes, i.e. french fries, to once a week. That was actually very firmly based in science. There had been a study showing the number of times per week french fries were served in schools was statistically related to the risk of being obese in, among children in that school. 
But um, legislators in states that grow a lot of potatoes really felt that strongly that this didn't belong there, so the potatoes were saved. Potatoes are still in schools. Um, the next was the pizza controversy. So the USDA originally wanted to get rid of this loophole that tomato paste counted as a full serving of vegetables because they were counting all the tomatoes that went into the paste, which is different than how they counted other things. It was really, they were trying to fix a problem. Well, it turns out the company that sells the most frozen pizza in the entire country had their legislator go to Congress and talk about how tomato paste really should count as a vegetable, which of course turned into pizza is a vegetable, um, which really made, was kind of a laughing stock. Eventually, though, the Federal Register finally came out, the final rules came out, and I'd like to talk about what I see as awesome things that happened. Number one, um, full, sugar, full sugar soda is out, so that finally happened after years and years and happening in cities and states and sort of a hodgepodge around the country, became federal law under smart snacks that you can't sell those full calorie um, sodas or sports drinks in schools at all. Um, and then fruits and vegetables, a lot was done to really promote those. So the rules around um, fruits and vegetables were A, they were considered two different categories. There were requirements about variety. So you really did have to have you know, lots of different types of vegetables available over the course of the week. And then another policy change was that in order for a meal to be counted as a reimbursable school lunch, it had to include a fruit or a vegetable. So that was another big change. So researchers have been able to study the impact on this. Um, we did a study looking at plate waste because that was a big concern and we were able to document with longitudinal data on the same kids before and after these rules went into effect showing that there was no increase in the proportion getting thrown away, so that was great. Other studies have come out really looking at the nutritional quality of meals before and after and showing that they have you know, they're more nutrient dense and they have fewer calories. So that's all good news. Then the administration changed and um, one thing that happened and this was sort of proposed about a year ago and just got released last fall is um, the child nutrition program, uh, the USDA released a flexibilities for milk, whole grains and sodium. And essentially what this did is this rolled back some of the regulations. Originally only, um, low fat white milk and skim milk and then skim flavored milk were allowed, but this puts back in low fat flavored milk. So I'm not exactly sure who was lobbying specifically for <laughs> low fat flavored milk, but it's there now. Um, the whole grains originally was supposed to be whole grain rich, which means more than 50% of the product is whole grain, and you were supposed to have 50% of your products be whole grain rich, and then it went to 100%. Well, now it's back down to 50%. And then sodium, which is probably the one that concerns me the most, is there was a you know quite long term, it was sort of a 10-year plan of slowly decreasing the sodium um, in school meals, and it had three different stages, and it kept getting put off and put off, and eventually, this rollback basically took the second level and put that one out in the future and got rid of the third level altogether. So I think the sodium um, changes, unfortunately, really got, took quite a big step backwards. So it was updated, not really based on evidence. So I just want to mention a couple um, people who have written specifically about uh, you know, we've talked a lot about behavior change of, of the population. Well, there's also behavior change of the researchers and the policymakers. So for researchers, um, there's this idea of strategic science, and this is from a paper by my colleagues, Christina Roberto and Kelly Brownell. And the idea is that um, in order for researchers to really have their science have a policy impact, you need to identify and connect with those change agents, which are typically the policy makers, but can also be people, um, sort of public health advocates who are, have those relationships and are able to lobby. You want to develop strategic questions, sort of figure out where, what are the fights about, what are people disagreeing about, and what kind of study can I do to answer that question. You want to answer it in the most rigorous manner you can. Um, and then this is really important, communicate that information, so don't just publish it in an academic journal, but put together policy briefs, do other sorts of media outreach to try to really get the word out so you can strengthen that bridge. 
And then Brownson had um, a paper back in 2006 called Researchers and Policymakers, Travelers in Parallel Universes. And I just put this up to kind of help us also realize that we are bringing two different cultures together here. Researchers and policymakers have very different incentives. You know, there's the things we care about, grants, publications, they care about re-election, recognition. We're accountable to different groups. We really value different types of data. We value empirical studies. Policymakers really listen to the media, they listen to their advisors, and they listen to stories from the field. So you need to think of ways to sort of incorporate that into the evidence that you're developing. And then this, I think, is also one of the big challenges, is that we have kind of a long time frame. We're willing to wait for the process of getting the funding, doing the study, publishing the study. Policymakers often can't wait for that. So trying to find ways to share information in a shorter time frame can be very helpful to bridge that gap. Thank you. <laughs>